Hi, I'm Charlotte Davis. I work for a small social enterprise called Fit to Learn. We change how people process and we work with many people, all disciplines, experts in the subject, but with small gaps that make them anxious or even people with really quite profound learning difficulties or people post-stroke, all ages that we work with them. And what I want to talk to you about today is neuroplasticity and autism. I think it's incredibly relevant to our current situation in the UK as everyone goes running around destroying everything. And I want you to stop and think. I want people to stop and have a really serious think about what we're doing with people and what we could do, which could really empower people and calm them down. So let us make sure this thing works. Humans, when they're born, their brains are relatively symmetrical. Left and right sides of the brain are relatively similar. And as they develop hand dominance, eye dominance, as they develop their bodies and brains, they should develop asymmetries. The two sides of the brain develop specialisms and they build their skills. Humans develop 0 to 25. Humans do some very serious developments, 0 to 7 or 8. It is most definitely not 4 or 5. Those years to 7, 8 are absolutely critical and they're where our senses and our motor skills come together and should develop properly. In people with learning difficulties, what is being seen by neurologists is that the asymmetries are not developing properly and that the people are not developing midline crossing and the ability to work coherently with both sides of their body and brain. That is really important to understand. And the more traffic we can get going across from one side of the brain to the other, then by and large, the easier people manage life. The better they cope, the more they understand in context. Here is one of my clients. He, in May 23, was in a school, which I happened to be working in the school, which was associated with it. And I was asked by school B to pop over because this child had recently hit somebody and they thought, but they just didn't know what to do because he often ran around the classroom. He was often impossible to teach. They felt that he might have hit a member of staff, but they couldn't make sense of his behaviour. And I was asked to come up and assess him. It wasn't a lot I could do because the chap, you know, really struggled. He struggled. He couldn't make a 12-piece jigsaw puzzle. He could put three pieces together at most, but really was struggling to make sense of pieces of a jigsaw. When somebody is doing that, it tells you they don't understand anything in context. When I asked him to draw some shapes and to draw a line across the page, his line only went partly across the page and then came back. That's telling me he hasn't got peripheral vision. He's operating in 5% of his vision. No one had noticed that. No optician, anyone else had mentioned this child was operating with just 5% of his vision. When we asked him to draw shapes, so we showed him a card, we counted to five, we turned the card over and asked him to copy the shape. The things, well, I mean, you know, his drawings are not great. His drawings of diamonds were coming out incredibly distorted. His drawings of the Union Jack, he couldn't remember all the lines. He's really scribbling. Left and right side of the eyes are not working together. He hadn't got the development really five-year-old. So we can see very easily he is really struggling developmentally. Very confused, very immature perception of shape. By September, I had managed to get his development moving. 
because I did one round of sound therapy with the technology called Tomatis Sound Therapy that agitates the muscles in the inner ear and starts the sound working better. The inner ear is our junction box. It's a, there in there is a thing called the vestibular system that links sound, vision, motor skills, facial muscles. It makes quite a big difference to how we operate if our sound is working better. And what is really exciting is, look, we can see he can put together, not brilliantly, because we started out in a very odd position, but we are actually putting together a 12-piece jigsaw puzzle. We're beginning to understand how the world fits together. And that is really quite exciting. When I asked him to draw the shapes, We've got far more symmetrical shapes, the body left and right beginning to work together in a coherent fashion. You know, we're not super good, but my goodness, we're a lot better than we were when we saw him in May. He hasn't got visual recall because he can't remember all the lines. You know, we're starting at a corner, we're finishing roughly at another corner. This looks a lot better than we started with. And for one round of 14 days of sound therapy, I am pretty pleased. He could not throw a ball in an arc from one side of his body to the other. So I knew we hadn't got really good development going. Really couldn't do that. And so we set him off with exercises to try and get a ball to cross over. And at this stage, we were working with what's called primitive reflex exercises, getting him to have better conscious control of his motor skills so that left and right sides of the body are communicating. He has a fabulous mother, works incredibly hard and is very diligent. So I got to see him again in November and by November, didn't matter what 12-piece jigsaw puzzle I put in front of him, he could do them and was looking good. The other thing was he could throw a ball a hundred times from left to right. And that is telling me we're getting what's called midline crossing. We are getting traffic going across the corpus callosum. So things are looking good. In September, I could look at his sound processing for the first time. And what I could see was it was suppressed. So it's absolutely down across the whole sound range. And I could also see that he was very left ear dominant. My first job is to get the sound up. I've got to get the sound processing up on both sides. And then I need to get him to right ear dominant. But we are making slow but sure progress in getting his sound work better. One of the issues I had was that his mother tongue wasn't English. And so I needed to get him to widen his sound range. This is not only a problem for non-native English speakers. It's also a problem for native English speakers whose regional dialect is not in mainstream English range. So Southern English is a quite a high pitched language, but different dialects can be quite deep and they can struggle to hear the full range of mainstream English. So sometimes I even have to retune English speakers to mainstream English so they can process all the sounds of English. English is quite a hard language auditorily to pick up anyway, but that's one thing that's important to do when you're doing sound therapy is to make sure a person can hear fully all the sound range necessary for, it, for, for us, the English language. Later, you might want to learn another language and you can retune the person and widen their sound range. But this boy, we need to get, get English. Fully. The other problem, which is very common in Britain, is that he was left ear dominant. If you are left ear dominant, the sound is having to bounce over to the right and to the left hemisphere where you start decoding language in your brain. 
You need to get it to the Wernicke's area as fast as possible. So if you're right ear dominant, it goes very quickly. And we need sound to work really quickly. If it's not working really quickly, then the person can't make sense of sound around them. They're not picking up speech and language quickly in the classroom. When they come to read for meaning and they combine sound and vision, their eyes will dysregulate. That is really important because you can be a smart person, but your sound processing is left ear dominant, causing a delay that can cause all sorts of other learning problems. It is really important we check ear dominance, the person can follow sound when it moves, and that left and right ears work together. So I need to move him over, and he was extremely left ear dominant, and that is what's causing what appears to be autism. So by March, we've got his sound curves up. He had by this stage, although we've got much more dysregulated, bumpy sound curves, he's just been mugged. And that would have affected him emotionally. I am, by this stage, I'm pretty happy about where we're going with motor skills. I'm pretty happy about how the sound is moving. And I've started moving on to looking at eye movements. I am not happy about his eye movements. The eyes do not work regularly together. We get spasms and the eyes are not working well. He goes to see a, a, an optician, but opticians are not well trained in how the eyes work with the brain and the whole body. And we have got to train our health professionals far better on how sound, vision, motor skills work together. We've got to train them so that they are supporting the teaching profession far better, so that people can behave much more calmly. But by June, we've got the sound curves up nicely, and we are still working on moving his sound over to right ear dominant. And it's going to take me a few months to get him to right ear dominant, but he is definitely making a lot more progress in terms of his understanding of what he's reading. He's definitely coping better with school. But his eye movements are not regular enough. And I am fairly blunt to all stakeholders in the school and in the, um, the home that he has got to exercise his eyes really widely and clearly. And those eyes have got to move separately to his head. And we've got to get the muscles around the eyes strengthened so that we can get the eyes working properly. But the sound is going well. The family, as I said, he's been mugged. The family's been made homeless. Mum works 12-hour shifts. If they can manage this kind of change and move him forward, quite frankly, anyone can. So to get his eye muscle strengthened, we've got to then get everything properly integrated. But the family are pretty much on board and working very hard. And gee, if you're on minimum wage and working long hours and subject to the very volatile housing conditions we've got in Britain, you get change. I'm impressed. I will go to the ends of the earth for you. Every child has the right to develop under the UN Charter on Children's Rights. We are not supporting any child in this country to ensure that every motor skill is properly in place. We are not supporting every child to make sure they can sound process properly, and a very large number cannot. We are not supporting every child in this country to make sure their eyes work together properly and the eyes can send proper messages to the brain and integrate with the other senses. We therefore have a very low skills culture and that keeps our country poor. We have got to do far better than that. Why am I passionate? I, I can't bear watching people trapped and for many years, I lived near this young man, let's call him Jay, and he lived a few doors away from me. 
in a care home that was run for profit, and he was trapped in a body that didn't work for him. During lockdown, he ran away and was run over. He couldn't cross the road safely on his own. He couldn't because his two eyes didn't work properly together. He couldn't make sense of what was going on because his sound processing didn't work well. Even to this day, from time to time, he kicks off, he gets out of the care home, he throws rocks and really is angry. We are going to pay for him to stay in care for the rest of his born days. He's angry and frustrated and bored. The police are often involved. But nobody, none of the stakeholders responsible for him will support any proper development. And even when I offered to do it for free, nobody would do it. We really have got to support development. And when I meet stakeholders who are willing to engage, gee, I will go to the end of the earth to support them. But when people will not engage, it's nearly impossible. And that is costing us all a fortune because that traps people in very frustrating situations. These are extremes, but it's a very large number of the population. And it's expensive. It's frustrating. It makes people unhappy. Why do we want to do this to people? I would suggest to you if we go into the prisons, we'll see people with the same problems. We have got to skill up as a nation. We have all got to support each other to much better states of physical health. And we have got to make sure that motor skills, sound and vision are in place before we start labelling anyone as neurodiverse. And even if we do, we are still going to need to support their development as far as possible because that is the most humane thing to do for anyone. So, seriously ask yourselves, why do we not put human development at the heart of our health and education systems? Why are we not, not making everyone fit to learn? Thank you for listening.